Part 1. False Justice Chapter 1. Introduction From a very young age, I was familiar with the plight of the poor. I grew up in a country called Suriname, a small nation on the northeast coast of South America. Both of my parents grew up very poor and have always been very open-hearted to the needy and willing to serve the less fortunate. Our family interacted with many different circles of people from many different social classes and backgrounds. In second grade, I began watching world news, which had a profound impact on me. I became aware of the world around me and of the different kinds of social justice dynamics at work on an international scale. My father was involved in foreign affairs, and when I was 11 years old, he became a diplomat for Suriname in Caracas, Venezuela, which had significant poverty at the time. I again found myself surrounded by people of all social classes. At times, I felt at home among the poorest of the poor who lived in the barrios where the police do not usually venture because of the crowded, maze-like streets where one can easily get lost. I was not put off by these neighborhoods. I was disturbed by the inequality. When I became a Christian at 14, I found there was a definite disconnect between my personal faith and the affinity I had towards the poor. I was a new believer with a compartmentalized understanding of Jesus. I did not know how to combine my devotional life with my social concern. I understood Jesus had compassion for the poor and wanted to feed them, but I did not understand his thoughts about the broader implications of social justice, like poor people getting pushed out of their neighborhoods by wealthy people moving in, or socioeconomic disparity across racial lines. As I grew in my faith, I learned about sanctification, heaven, the Lord's return, personal holiness, and sharing Christ with the lost. I believed in a personal Jesus who had a lot to say about my personal spirituality, but not much to say about social justice. The Connection Between Christianity and Social Justice It wasn't until a few years later, when I attended Southeastern University, a private Bible college in Lakeland, Florida, that I was confronted with the issue of how Christianity connects to social justice. On my campus, I ran into a group of students who had been deeply affected by liberal theology, challenging the theological views we were learning in the classroom. They were zealous about the subject of societal injustice and had a strong commitment to their views, desiring to affect change. Due to my natural pull towards the issue of the poor and justice, I often found myself in conversation with these students, but I did not agree with what they were saying. Their claims and beliefs dismissed and undermined clear, orthodox, evangelical theology, calling into question the nature of Christ, his mediation, his resurrection, and his deity. I knew I could not agree with them on these points. I was sure that what I had learned about Jesus up until that point was true. However, through my many discussions with these students, the Bible verses they highlighted brought to light the fact that my understanding was compartmentalized. Their rhetoric did not win me over to their views, but the Bible verses they quoted alerted me. These students discussed the Old Testament prophets and what they had said. I had not spent a lot of time in the Old Testament before then, but I was introduced to passages like Jeremiah 22.16, where the connection is made that hearing the cause of the poor and the needy is part of knowing God. He judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord? Jeremiah 22.16 I had always understood my walk of knowing Jesus in the context of my quiet time, character development, and sharing my faith when I had occasion to. But the idea that intimacy with God extended into judging the cause of the poor and needy was entirely foreign to me. My interaction with these fellow students began to confront some of my preconceived ideas. For instance, when reading the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, see, Genesis 19, 1 through 29. The personal way in which I saw the Bible influenced my premise that 
Sodom and Gomorrah were judged for their immorality. I failed to recognize that, according to Ezekiel, they were destroyed based on the social indictments against them. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50. Though immorality was practiced in the culture of Sodom and undoubtedly was part of the reason for God's judgment, this was never the stated purpose in Scripture for their destruction. The reason for Sodom's judgment was more incriminating and applicable to many of us. God judged Sodom because of pride, overeating, excessive time-wasting, and overlooking the poor. God's Plan for Redemption In the prophets, I discovered a God who through the cross of Christ is executing his plan of redemption for entire people groups, nations, and even the planet. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, and the other prophetic voices of the Old Testament seem to have something to say about a God who is deeply committed to seeing justice brought forth on the earth. I began to make sense of this Jesus who came to take away the sins of the world both individually and socially. I began to understand the one who would both renew a believer's soul and renew the societies of the earth. I never entered into a crisis of faith as I discovered these facets of Jesus, but I was being thrust into another arena of thinking. When I was a college senior, I began seeking the Lord about the subject of justice. Because of the poverty I witnessed growing up, I often wondered if God was calling me to work among the poor. He began to speak to me through the scriptures about poverty, oppression, government, and justice. My vision and faith were beginning to expand, and I was seeing Jesus, the God of justice, throughout the Word. Around this time, a colleague of mine introduced me to the life of St. Francis of Assisi. I had never seriously looked at St. Francis's life, and as I began to read, I was deeply moved by his commitment to prayer, fasting, holiness, preaching, and touching the poor. On various occasions, I would make real concerted efforts to move to the inner city, but the Lord would surprisingly always close the doors. After several years, the Lord directed my wife, Esther, and me to move to Kansas City to be a part of the International House of Prayer of Kansas City, a ministry that is focused on 24-7 prayer for justice and doing 24-7 works of justice. Then, about five years into my time with IHOP KC, while I was giving leadership to the night watch, midnight to 6 a.m., I hit an existential crisis and began to wrestle intensely over the direction and purpose of my life. It was a season of great tension for me. I had a deep desire for impact and was wondering whether or not I had made the best decision to be involved in the prayer movement. I questioned whether I was using the full potential of my gifts and talents. I could not see the fuller connection between the worship movement and touching the poor. I began seeking the Lord and wondering if it was time for Esther and me to go live among the poor. I was grappling with other questions as well. If we moved, what would we do? What would it be like? What would our objectives be? In my college years, I had wanted to travel around the world and go to the poorest places of the earth. I was asking the Lord if the time to make that trip was now. Two of my friends had just returned from Italy and told me about their visit with Franciscan monks. I began thinking about going to Assisi, Italy to visit St. Francis's monastery. One morning, a few weeks into this crisis, I woke up out of a dead sleep and heard the Holy Spirit say, Go to Mexico City. This direction from the Lord made no sense to me. I had no contacts in Mexico City and no idea what I would do there. I went on with my day, pondering why the Lord would direct me to Mexico City. I'd been thinking about a dear friend of mine who lived in Florida, with whom I had often discussed issues concerning the poor and justice. 
I really wanted to see him. I had not talked with him for some time about these things and thought it would be good to reconnect and get some counsel from him. When I called him to see if we could meet, he said, I would love to meet with you. You can meet me in Florida in three weeks, or you can meet me in Mexico City next week. I'm going there with a group of college students. I could not believe my ears. I joined my friend and the group of young adults in Mexico City. We had hours of discussions about justice. We spent time among the poor, and afterwards we would debrief and study the word. When it was time to sleep, I paired up six hard chairs against each other to make a bed. This was a perfect situation for me. I was among the poor, I had a luxurious bed, and I was able to spend a lot of time in small group study and alone with the Lord concerning the issue of justice. One morning, the students invited me to go on a road trip with them. I am not much of a sightseer, but I agreed to join them. I had no idea where we were going, but as we were nearing our destination, about two hours outside of Mexico City, I realized we were on our way to a monastery. The tour guide explained that Dominicans now ran the monastery, but it had originally been used by Franciscans. When he said that, I realized the Lord was ambushing me. I began to feel his tangible presence resting on me, and I separated myself from the group to be alone and think and pray about the issue of the poor and justice. I began to feel disturbed in my spirit about the issue of theological compromise related to the subject of social justice. I went from wrestling about my own purpose in life to wrestling theologically. I began to realize that there is a justice that God desires and one that is humanistic. The Only True Theology for Social Justice When we returned to the place we were staying, I still had a sense of the presence of the Lord on my heart. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The present social justice movement is preparing the poor of the earth to receive the Antichrist. His words shook me at the core of my being. I did not expect him to say what he said and did not even see the truth of what he spoke until I heard it from heaven. From that moment, I began to see Scripture through a different lens. It was the first time things truly began to integrate for me. I began to see the gospel truly as the answer for every sphere of society, instead of vacillating between the personal gospel and the social gospel. The personal gospel often does not translate into social concern, and social concern may not translate into personal holiness. This compartmentalization of Jesus and his gospel has left a theological vacuum, leaving many to have their questions answered by searching out other ideologies and false messengers instead of searching out the heart of God through Christ and his word. Jesus has made all the necessary provision for justice on the earth through his death, burial, resurrection, and unfolding his Father's eternal plan for justice. This plan is being manifest now in part, but will be fully made evident when Jesus returns. He alone will accomplish justice among the nations, not another god or any pantheon of gods. Some are suggesting that all the face of the world should join together. Beloved, Jesus is not in a discussion with Muhammad and Buddha about justice. Jesus is not at the council table with the very forces of darkness that he came to destroy. See 1 John 3, 8. Christ alone has the answer, as found in his gospel, for true justice in the world. The experience in Mexico set me on a journey to find out, what does Jesus have to say about justice? What is his plan for justice now and in the coming age? How will he go about accomplishing justice? One of my favorite passages on this in the Old Testament is found in Isaiah 42, where the prophet declares God's strategy for justice and that it is a plan clearly established before the foundation of the earth. Justice is in the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he alone will establish it in every sphere of society in the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only true theology of social justice and hope for the poor.